Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Pamela Fennell and I'm the chair of the IBIPSA Education Committee. I'm delighted to welcome you to this, which is the first in a series of webinars that we're going to be running in 2023 on urban building energy modelling. Before we get into the seminar, I just wanted to tell you um, a little bit about the um, IBIPSA Education Committee and what we're here for. So the committee um, aims to identify education and training needs throughout the building performance simulation community. Um, and that includes academia, the private sector and government. And part of what we're here to do is to initiate, develop, encourage and sometimes coordinate new education materials and methods. Um, and it's very much part of our mission that we offer training sessions to members as well as to non-members. So welcome everybody who has been able to join us. What we're going to do today, we'll do a quick introduction, uh, then I'll hand over to Yu Qian for his presentation, um, and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. So you should see that there is a box for Q&A. If you could use that for your questions and answers, uh, and I will put them, I'll put the questions to you, Qian. You can also upvote questions if someone's already asked something that you would like to, um, to ask as well, and we'll take them in order of uh, popularity in that sense. So I'm very pleased to have with us today, Yu Qian. Um, Yu Qian received his PhD uh, from the MIT Sustainable Design Lab. Um, and prior to that, he graduated as valedictorian from the National University of Singapore. And he also has an MPhil from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Gates Scholar. Between his studies, he found time to be the Senior Assistant Director in the Singapore Ministry of Trade and Industry, as well as adjunct faculty at the Singapore University of Social Science, where he was teaching on BIM. And alongside all of that, he has also co-founded two startups. So we're very delighted, um, Yu Qian, that you found time in that very busy schedule to, to be with us today and uh, to share your seminar, which is on urban building energy modeling concepts and use cases. So I will hand over to you um, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. So thank you very much. Um... Pamela and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, um, no matter where you're calling in from. So I'm calling in from Singapore right now, so it's actually um, a night for me, but good morning and good afternoon to you guys in Europe or the US. Uh, and of course, thank you very much for uh, to Pamela for putting this um, wonderful seminar series together. And let me just share my screen. So I think in some sense, I am a little bit glad that I'm going first because I look at the wonderful list of speakers after me and I think it's nice that I go first so I don't have so much pressure to keep up with uh, all these amazing speakers after me. Yep, so I hope that um, you guys can see my screen. So for today, I'll be talking about um, concepts and use cases for urban building energy modeling. In short, we like to call them UBEMs. And um, a lot of this is actually from my PhD work, uh, which is just defended a couple of months ago. So I'll be talking more about uh, an overview of what UBEM is and how our lab, uh, our group sees the different use cases could be, and also show some um, quick examples. Um, probably wouldn't go into so much detail in the interest of time, but some quick examples on how we work with different cities and municipalities to build um, this UBEMs to answer policy-based questions. So I think a lot of you would be aware by now that since the 19 50s, uh, the world's urban population has um, risen sixfold from about 750 million to I think over 4 billion right now. And uh, since the year 2008, there are actually more people uh, living in urban areas than, than before. And um, a lot of different articles, research, um, global organizations have projected that at least around we, we are expected to have about 70% of the world's population to be urbanized by 2050. And so this, uh, we are not just looking at mega cities, but large, even mid-sized, regional and smaller cities as well. These are all expected to grow. And of course, with the growth in all of these urban regions, there are, of course, um, a lot of things that 
we need to take note of and a lot of different impact on the urban built environment. Uh, we know that urban built environment is a significant contributor to annual carbon emissions. Um, buildings use up significant amount of energy. And more importantly, the global floor area is expected to, to double. And um, finally, um, the buildings that are already around here, 90% of them, uh, we expect them to still be here in the year 2050. So obviously some of these are built um, really long ago and there is inherently a lot that we can do to make them more energy efficient and emit less carbon emissions. So the fortunate thing is that cities, um, on the positive side of things, fortunately cities and municipalities around the world, they are realizing the resource burdens as well as the, the large amount of energy and emissions associated with growth. And of course, a lot of this is uh, population, economic growth, so on and so forth. And um, a lot of the cities, they are taking initiatives to tackle this problem. In Boston, for example, buildings account for around 70% of community carbon emissions and represent one of the greatest opportunity for emissions reduction. So one key target in um, Boston's climate action plan. So these plans all have slightly different names, but they all target somewhat the same things, right? So in Boston's climate action plan, um, one key target is to retrofit and electrify at least 80% of existing buildings over the next 30 years. And currently, I think it's a little more than 50,000 buildings in Boston uh, receive no cost energy assessment from one of their programs called Massive. Uh, and this is similar for many other cities, uh, Chicago as well, buildings are primary target of reduction as they contribute roughly 70% of emissions. And finally, um, we know that energy efficiency plays a pivotal role in decarbonizing cities in Europe as well. Uh, in Europe, I think it's about 75% of the buildings in EU, they are built before any energy performance standards existed. And, and they will need to be renovated or retrofitted in one way or another to be more energy efficient uh, to hit the, the goals that we are, we are intending for them to hit. So now the goals are, are pretty clear, right? So we know what the goals are. Uh, we know the targets that we want to, but the, re the real question is how do we achieve these targets? And uh, this is a question that many cities, large and small, in fact, have been asking. Of course, the large cities, they have resources to, to commission um, energy modeling teams or, or multidisciplinary consultant teams, uh, work with research institutes, universities to develop this uh, large scale stock models. But what about the mid sized or the smaller cities? And a lot of, in a lot of these action plans, the targets are clear but not so much the detailed strategies to, to achieve these targets. And so the question really is, how do we use data-driven methods to translate these goals into actionable strategies, uh, detailed actionable strategies that can help us get there? And so this is where um, urban building energy modeling or UBAMs come in. Um, UBAMs are essentially a derivation of uh, building energy modeling, right? So BAMs is, not something that is new. It has been around for decades and has been proven to be a cost efficient and effective method to stimulate energy use of buildings uh, at building level to, to essentially reduce energy use and to identify different um, energy savings measures, ETMs, energy conservation measures before uh, we actually physically build them. So UBAMS is in fact scaling BAMS to urban scale. And of course there are some um, computational issues, um, data availability issues, which I will talk a little bit about um, later on. But the whole idea is very simple. UBAMS is just scaling these BAMs to um, urban city scales. So um, it ranges from maybe tens of buildings to thousands. Um, I think the biggest one we have built is probably about 100,000, 80 to 100,000 buildings. But of course, this has to be segmented uh, with the simulations run in parallel before we compute the, the results. So over the years, um, the recent years, I would say, um, BAMs, uh, UBAMs have proliferated and uh, there are a couple of really good uh, research groups working on them. Um, of course, UCL, our group at MIT, um, National Labs, and a, a couple of others. Um, and there are different lens that we can essentially look at uh, look at these models from the so top down, I 
wouldn't say that top down is, is essentially BAM because when we talk about school BAMs, they're usually physics based. So we simulate, uh, we use physics based engineering model, then we scale them up. This top down models, if we maybe read review papers or things like that, a lot of these top down models, they are statistical models uh, that maybe use statistical data science methods of uh, simple regressions all the way to more complex um, machine learning methods to, to simulate energy use, but they are not uh, in, in, in inherently physics based. So in recent years with the proliferation of course, data science, machine learning methods, we have seen more um, hybrid ones, uh, the one in, on bottom right, which use um, machine learning methods together with physics based uh, to overcome some of the shortcomings such as um, computational limitation or data limitations. So in our group at MIT, uh, we identified sort of like a, a workflow that uh, lay out certain steps to inherently construct uh, UBAMs for different use cases. And I'll talk about some of these use cases a little bit later, but uh, the three key pieces of the, the data is really very simple, right? We need the geometric data. So we're looking at the second column here, uh, the data pre-processing step. So the three key pieces, we need the geometry data, the, the building geometries that, that, uh, that represents the building in the area that we are interested to simulate. And this can come from uh, many different data forms. The simplest and the most common ones are probably GIS shapefiles, which um, is a common data format and um, urban planners around the world like to use. So with GIS shapefiles, we get the footprints and then we get the heights of the building either by LIDAR, uh, Google, some machine learning method to, to extract the features or the most simpler way we can just manually measure them. So with the GIS shapefiles and the heights, we extrude these to become sort of like 2.5D, 3D models. And those form the baseline geometry of uh, the building. Of course, in many other regions or with some research group, you have more detailed or high fidelity data in the form of CDGML, um, even LiDAR, GeoJSON, and shapefiles are inter interchangeable. But uh, the first piece of the puzzle is, is, is inherently the geometry data. And with that, we can build the, the urban building geometry. Uh, the second part of the the second piece of the puzzle is uh, what we call non-geometric data. And this usually pertains to the, the non-geometrical physical properties of the, the building. What kind of wall material, um, the U value of the wall, uh, what type of roof, uh, the window to wall ratio, whether it's single pane, double pane, um, things like that. So this will be converted to, uh, will be converted as what we call building simulation templates. And this will accompany the geometry, of course. Uh, and at urban scale level, we sometimes assign this building template at archetype level instead of to individual buildings. So we are talking about, let's say, 50,000 to 100,000 building in uh, a region, for example, Boston. We might uh, simplify the building stock to say uh, maybe 50 to 100 different archetypes. So this really depends on the use case, but it may be 20 to 50 archetypes, 50 to 100 archetypes. And with each archetype, uh, we assign a building simulation template to it. So archetypes are simply a composite representation of buildings that are somewhat similar. So for example, in the US, there'll be single family homes in a region will likely have a will likely have the same archetype assigned to it. Sometimes we split by simply um, the program and age of the building. So program can be residential, uh, institutional, commercial. And that's why the vintage of the age to assign the archetypes. And uh, finally, the last piece of the puzzle, of course, is the, the, weathered, uh, the weather files, which are now easily available and downloadable uh, on websites like Energy Plus website, or I think Ladybug has a repository of different simulation temp, uh, different weather files for simulation as well. And depending on whether measured energy data is available, if measured energy data is available, we can calibrate these buildings. So after running the simulation using the building geometry together with the simulation templates, we usually get baseline results. So the, the question is sometimes we don't really know how accurate or inaccurate this, this results are. And we want the baseline to represent the as built or the stock as, as closely as possible. 
so that then we can use that model for different scenario planning. So for example, if we have a good um, baseline model of a, a region that we're interested in, we can then try to understand different scenarios. Like okay, what if I improve the, the insulation and I take some parameters? Uh, what if I, what if I uh, maybe install heat pumps for the uh, region and how much energy can I save? So the, the bottom line, of course, is the baseline model will have to be uh, relatively accurate and representative of how much energy the, the region is actually using. So if, if, we could be, uh, if we have measured energy data, which I understand is uh, sometimes difficult to get in certain jurisdictions because of privacy concerns. So it is uh, almost impossible to get full measured energy data for every single building in the region of interest. So for example, if we are modeling 10,000 buildings, we might only have measured data for 200, 300, or 500. It's in good cases, maybe a thousand, which is pretty rare. So there are some uh, statistical or machine learning methods that we can uh, sample. We can do some sampling and scale this measured energy data up to represent the entire, or, or clustering methods, of course, to represent the entire region. Uh, but I will not be talking about this, but. Uh, today because in the interest of time, of course, and I think some other speakers will cover this as well. So if we do have some measure energy data, we can calibrate the baseline model. So the key is to have the, the baseline model, um, the results of the baseline model and the outputs as closely in sync as possible to the measured energy data and to get the parameters correct as well, right? So it's calibration is always an iterative process. We make sure that the output matches and then we go back and tweak the parameters and then we simulate again. And then it goes in a somewhat like a loop to, to make the baseline model uh, better and better. Uh, of course, again, with calibration, there's a lot of different ways uh, we can do it. Simple statistical way all the, all the way up to um, using surrogate models with neural nets or random forest. But again, this is beyond uh, my scope today. So once we have the calibrated model, we can use it for different uh, scenario planning and use cases as well. So uh, with this, in fact, uh, I think one thing that I'd just like to, to point out is that uh, there are a lot of inherent, a lot of research groups doing a lot of good work in this. And, and this model in academia, they, they tend to get more and more detailed and more and more technically complex. So a couple of years ago, um, three, three years ago, when I just started out my PhD, what we did at our lab is to really take a step back to look at uh, what is the key use of this UBEMS, of this urban building energy models, right? And I guess that that led to uh, the, the topic of my presentation today. So instead of having models that are always getting more and more technically complex, uh, we just throw all the complex machine learning methods at it deeper and deeper neural nets, make them more and more detailed. Maybe we take a step back and we see what are the key use cases and what can we actually uh, use this model for? Uh, what are the questions that uh, we want answered with these models? And who are, the, who are the stakeholders that these different models serve, right? Uh, and with that, our group actually came out with four key use cases. So I'm not saying that uh, they are definitely the best categorization or the best classification uh, of use cases, but uh, this is, of course, from our experience and uh, the type of stakeholders that we have been working with. So with this, after kind of taking a step back and taking a look at all the work that we have done, the different partners, stakeholders, we came up with four key use cases. And the idea is that these four use cases have different focus audiences. Uh, they have different model requirements. And the key is that they create value at different parts of the, the value chain and the process. So the first use case is for urban planning and new neighborhood design. So uh, from the name of it, we know that this doesn't require model of, uh, models of really high fidelity. They don't need the models to be super accurate. Uh, some use them as part of the, some consultancy firms, for example, use them, or architecture firms, planning firms use them as part of the uh, generative design workflow, where they simulate, even sometimes with AI or um, generative adversary networks, generate different, Messings, uh, different layouts, different plot ratios, and then consequentially, with this, we can also understand uh, what is the energy use for for the different messings or the different design. 
So this is more at the uh, the front part of the pipeline, more preliminary to schematic design, uh, urban planning, conceptual design stage, where we also add the element of, of energy, understanding the energy use to it. So it's not just uh, the cost, the port ratio, the GFA, but at the early stage, we also want to understand the energy implications. And the, the second use case uh, is what we call stock level carbon reduction strategies. And this, I would say, perhaps form uh, the majority of, of use cases and the majority of our, our work right now. So mainly we work with cities who already have uh, a rather mature building stock. And we try to construct UBEMs or, or urban net building energy models that represent the existing building stock. And then we try to replicate that with the baseline simulation and see uh, what kind of retrofitting strategies or ECMs, energy conservation measures, we can actually put in to, to make the city uh, consume less, to help the city consume less energy, right? And in many cases, uh, different cities, they actually have different policy levers in mind. So we call them policy levers. Uh, they might be thinking of different incentive programs. Uh, and so I'm speaking really, really broadly here, right? Because whether it's, if it's in the US, Asia, uh, Europe, the, the type of political constraints and policy levers, uh, funding sources will be significantly different, but um, everyone is looking to, of course, do something for, for the built environment and the building stock. So it might be the case where a jurisdiction or the municipality wants to understand, okay, if I fund uh, an insulation program or weather, weatherization program, how much uh, carbon impact in terms of energy reduction and, and carbon savings I can have things like that. So stock level carbon reduction strategies, uh, these models will help us understand that. And of course there are different ways to calibrate uh, these models depending on how much, uh, how many, or how much access to measured energy data we actually have. So uh, at stock level, we can also zoom in to be more granular and detailed and look at building level recommendations. So instead of looking at citywide so if you take a step back and look at citywide policy makers, uh, like planning or redevelopment authorities, they usually don't look at individual buildings per se because these policy levers, they typically target different types or different clusters or different regions of buildings, sometimes archetypes. So at the stock level carbon reduction strategies, when we calibrate, we typically don't calibrate the building at uh, building level, we calibrate them at sometimes archetype level, sometimes if we don't have measured energy data, we can't, uh, we unfortunately can't calibrate them. But the idea is that if we go down to building level, we want to be making building level recommendations, and then we need to be calibrating the, the UBEMs and assigning the templates at a much finer level of granularity to have this, uh, to have this simulation results make sense. Because we can't take, for example, a stock level, model calibrated on archetype level. And then we try to pick up individual buildings to say, okay, let's now look at this building uh, 159 or this building there, because that wouldn't be accurate, right? So the next step or the next use case is of course to go one level down deeper to calibrate it at uh, building level. And um, finally, the last, the last part, uh, the last use case essentially is what we call buildings to grid integration. Uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, an area which is a little bit more nascent. So we don't have that much uh, data or case studies on this, but essentially if you look around the world, a lot of, uh, a lot of the generation plants, they are, they are just there to cater to the peak loads. And a lot of these plants are uh, not uh, really sustainable. They're not green, they're pretty dirty. So the key idea is whether we can, and of course the building, draw quite a significant amount of energy, right? So the key idea here is whether we can uh, better synchronize the demand and supply or even uh, control this demand and supply in some sense so that we can uh, reduce the overall peak energy that's required, uh, reduce the generation facilities and have better, more fine, uh, better final control of the supply and demand. And of course, with a lot of uh, changes around the world, things like EVs, now we have EV chargers uh, in buildings. This will change a lot of this. Uh, so this is the next, this is my next slide. I know it's a little bit hack. Uh, I would 
maybe pick a little bit here and there to talk about it. And I think it's probably a little bit difficult to read from the slide, but the key idea is that for every use case, uh, the, the key users, the key stakeholders are significantly different. So for example, for use case one, it's mainly urban planners, architects, uh, use case two, municipalities and agencies, down to use case three, would be building portfolio owners, individual building owners. And uh, the geometries and the building templates, the requirements are, are very different as well. So for example, for urban planning and new neighborhood design, simple messings uh, will do. For stock level carbon reduction strategies, we sometimes want the, we, we often often want the geometries to be more representative. Um, they might not need to have uh, all, the, all the complex free forms that the actual buildings might take uh, architecture in an architecture sense, or sometimes the roof might be all flat. I mean, one fun fact is that if you look at all the UBAMs uh, around the world, you will notice maybe that most of those have uh, kind of like the flat roof syndrome. We, we call it a flat roof syndrome because we don't really, um, we don't really extrude or, or model the roofs as they are is extruded by hikes. So that suffice for stock level carbon reduction strategies. But as we go down to uh, building level recommendations, we want these geometries to be more representative. And of course the outputs will be, will be different for neighborhood planning and design. We might be happy with a simple neighborhood or precinct EUI, representative EUI. As we go down, we might want hourly, sub, uh, sub hourly, and of course down to buildings to create integration. We want them to uh, be of the finest time step, smallest time step, because we want the least uh, uncertainty. And of course the calibration needs uh, differ significantly as well for neighborhood planning if we are doing um, if we are trying to understand the implications of energy using generative design we don't really need the model to be calibrated there's no way to calibrate it as well because there's just no measured data to benchmark against at stock level we calibrate it to archetype level and we found that that is that usually suffices uh, to answer these questions that uh, the music municipalities or cities are interested to answer uh, sometimes we, we don't even need to, to calibrate it because data is just difficult to get. And of course, there are many different ways that we can calibrate it, right? We can use Bayesian calibration methods, uh, machine learning method, statistical sampling tools, so on and so forth. And as we go down to building level, uh, we need this to be calibrated, of course, at a final level of granularity. And so this is perhaps, uh, I think, one of the most interesting charts, but I would think it might be a little bit controversial. I'm not sure whether controversial is the right word. Uh, the key here is we want to try to represent and understand what is the cost and value capture, the cost versus the, the, of building this UBAMS versus the value capture, right? So uh, while we're writing this paper, we actually surveyed uh, and we spoke to the stakeholders that we usually work with, uh, cities, multidisciplinary consultancy firms, urban planners, so on and so forth. And we found that, so the, the y-axis is actually uh, kind of like the, the value capture and then the x-axis are the different uh, applications, right? And we found that they, they actually scale in, in a sense that the cost, for example, to build uh, an UBAM for the first use case is pretty low, right? It's quite cheap. If you commission a consultancy team to build it, they might just charge you tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes even lesser, sometimes slightly more, uh, but the value is, uh, as a couple of magnitudes higher, right? But as we go down to the second and third use case, it is more expensive, uh, not just in terms of dollar and cents, but resources wise, because you need to be, you need to now have more representative geometry. Uh, you need to have finer building templates with finer details, but the value that you get is, is a lot um, higher as well, because now we are saying that, okay, we can save energy for, entire, uh, for the entire city. And then we can look at building level recommendations that we can make more informed decisions. Uh, and of course, we didn't get sufficient data points uh, for the first four use case because that is inherently just um, rather nascent. So I know that I'm a little bit out of time, so I just speed up for the uh, remainder of my slides. So the next part is I uh, want to introduce another concept, right? So um, the key idea is that building an UBAM is always inherently difficult because we need uh, a lot of different data. And of course, for the first or second use case, some of this data might not um, always be available. But 
the key idea is that we can, for geometric and non-geometric data, there are inherently a lot of different uh, data sources that we can we need to be putting together. And a lot of this can be different. Uh, they vary from city to city because there's really no one standard uh, data set that caters to every single region around the world. So for example, um, if you are looking at data sources from uh, for geometric data, we can look at open data, government websites, uh, research platforms that, that gives us shape files. So some cities in the US, uh, they have a little bit more resources. So they have maybe a small team of GIS manager, just one or two to manage shape files. Um, some don't have, if you look at the smaller cities, they will never have the resource to, to come out with all those. So we need to maybe uh, scrape data from OpenStreetMaps or, or Google Maps or Google Earth, something, or satellite data even to extract the building footprints. And for non-geometric uh, data, there are a lot of different uh, means to get those as well. APIs, open data, uh, sometimes building audits. Uh, in the US, in certain regions, we get property tax assessment files, so on and so on. So to build a, an urban building energy model is always not that straightforward. And as so I recall, the very first uh, Uben that, that I constructed, right? That at that point of time, I haven't taken so many coursebooks and I don't have all the, the requisite uh, skills. So I, uh, building an UBAM is inherently quite a big task uh, for me at the early stage. So for my very first UBAM, what I did was uh, I put together LIDAR data and uh, raw that LIDAR data, as you, as you know, just to get the geometry, uh, that took almost, I think, two to three months just to process. Uh, the data set is huge, it's about one terabyte I think 1.2 terabyte worth of point cloud data. And there, there's a lot of uh, processing work that needs to be done, right? So for example, um, just for use case, so this was for use case to a stock level model uh, in a region in the US, it's about 20,000 buildings. Just to get uh, the geometries, there is inherently a lot of pro processing work that I need to do. And to be honest, some of this really don't fall under the scope of my, my PhD. So for example, I need to sample the building points to construct the building footprints. I need to write uh, scripts or rules to filter away certain structures uh, like that, that, doesn't, that are not inherently buildings, like, uh, like swimming pools, uh, car garages, or things like that. Uh, the, the LiDAR information needs to be simplified uh, because energy simulation programs like Energy Plus, they don't do well with all the weird shapes. So the zonings and the thermal zones needs to be simplified. Uh, and of course, remove the trees and reconstruct some of the region. Uh, and then what I did was to, to put together the various data sets, grab them from the county's open data, text assessment data uh, to get some of the building properties, LIDAR sensors, so on and so forth. And then that took me a couple more weeks or, or even months, right? So this is a simple uh, image of uh, the footprints and some of the centroids with certain property information, building information, and then we all merge them together using spatial joint to kind of build a, a baseline data set to begin with. And of course, there's a lot more work that's involved and that entails. So then the question I had at a point of time was, is, is more really better? Or maybe we can do, uh, maybe less is more, right? We can do more with less. So is it the case where everything, every time we want to be building an urban building energy model, we need to go through such a tedious process, uh, like every researcher has to do, or every city planner or municipality who don't really have the resource. So if you're familiar with um, tech firms and how tech startups work, what they do was they, they iterate very quickly uh, in these sprints and they built what they call MVPs, right? Uh, minimal viable products that is essentially a version with just enough features to solve the core problems, but you don't need like a full-fledged product that's being built out, right? So if you're testing a new feature for web apps or a new uh, SaaS software solution, you build a minimum viable product, and if it works, it gets stakeholder buy-in, then you build on it. And then the question is, can we take this concept and translate it to UBAMs? And so we came up with this concept of the minimal viable UBAM. And of course, there, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of discussions as to what entails a minimal viable UBAM. Uh, we have thoughts on minimal viable UBAM for different use cases, but in the interest of time, again, I wouldn't go so much detail into this. Uh, so the key idea here is to, to test out this uh, minimal viable UBAM, this MVP concept, and whether this will in fact work 
to with policymakers and actual uh, and actual practical applications. We built uh, a web app for it. Uh, we call it Ubemio. Um, so this was how it looked like two years ago when we built it. I think it's now a lot better because there are more people working on it with more features. But the key idea is that this allows uh, city planners, um, energy modelers, and, and anyone in fact to rapidly prototype and to rapidly build this uh, UBEMS with uh, minimal inputs. We have like temperate libraries and things like that. So at the point of time where uh, I, I built it with one or two other students, uh, it only has an urban model generator and an urban model visualizer. So the generator, of course, as the name suggests, allows you to build, um, allows you to generate UBANs very quickly and the visualizer allows you to uh, visualize results. So this is the backbone of it. Again, I don't want to bore you guys with the details, uh, but the fun part is that you can put in simple shape files, GeoJSON files, representative of the building region, and just grab and assign templates from a uh, representative of different climate zones. And uh, it the, the Python backend and the code automatically builds the geometry and assigns the template for you. So to test out this concept, uh, so yeah, this was just an example of the very first pilot that we had. So to test out this concept, uh, one and a half years ago, we invited CD representatives from all over the world. Uh, we started with eight cities that has a uh, carbon inventory, some policy levers that they're interested to explore with their built environment. And of course, they represent a lot of different climate zones. So this was still somewhat in, in COVID. So we did a lot of this online uh, over three days to a week, but uh, they represent a really diverse pool. So some of them are urban planners, uh, some, I think there was a mayor who joined us, or, but there are some people with completely no energy modeling background, some with very strong uh, building physics, technical knowledge, so on and so forth. So we gathered together um, eight cities, representative for eight cities, and uh, we use the tool that we built to construct what we call minimum viable UBEMS or SEED, SEED model, S-E-E-D. So these are regions that uh, are of interest to them. And essentially they want to be implementing policy levers to scale these policy levers to the larger cities. But we wanted to see and uh, test the hypothesis as to whether whether just in three days or a week, we can use less resources to still answer some of these questions that uh, typically might take like a full city scale model to, to answer. Okay, so these are the um, eight seed models that were constructed over, over the course of three days to a week. And yeah, so of course I wouldn't go into detail of the different things that they are interested, the, the cities are interested to explore, but they are really, really different because we have um, cities, like Singapore and, and Cairo. Singapore, you know, it's predominantly very, very hot throughout the year. Uh, we have places in, in Europe, um, Braga, Portugal, um, Dublin, and then we have US all the way to Montreal, which can get uh, really cold. So as you can see, because of, of course, uh, building physics and some of these built environment policy levers are, are they don't often exist in silos. They are often um, influenced sometimes by political inclinations, decisions, and things like that. But these are just some technologies that we focus solely on the technological and the technical part. Uh, we, we don't take into account all the, all the policy, all the political constraints, things like that. But these are the technologies that we export. So some, of course, they wanted to export eight, some 10, some 20, but for consistency, we kept them to a baseline scenario. Scenario one, which is uh, shallow, we call it a shallow retrofit. So that means that it takes less cost implications and it's cheaper, faster to implement. As there are a scenario two, which is a depot uh, left retrofitting level, which is more uh, capital intensive and resource intensive. Uh, so of course with the seed we, we ran simulations to find out how this, uh, how the scenario one and scenario two shallow deep retrofit uh, was you, what kind of value that can be captured in terms of energy savings. So uh, so you can see across the different regions, uh, most with their technological implementations managed to reduce energy. Uh, Braga's case is slightly different. They want to understand the uh, consequences of future climate as well. So we use future climate file, which is why you see a spike uh, for Braga instead of it going down. So just two more slides uh, before I wrap this off. Uh, so the second thing we also wanted to, to explore was would this inherently with all this implementation, will it shift uh, the peak load, right? For example, in uh, some regions like 
like Q or Middlebury, they are electrifying the heating systems. So of course the peak load uh, shift from maybe like a winter day to a summer day because uh, they have new peaks now that's heating dominated and have completely different peak demand and day. And uh, we also need to kind of sync this with uh, the grid supply and demand. And finally, the most important uh, chart of all is we took the carbon emissions from the resultant uh, energy savings and outputs and we put in their targets as well. So those red lines are the targets that the different cities have. And we wanted to see with the retrofits whether these cities, they can actually uh, meet their, their targets. And of course, some of them did, some of them didn't. And that's where they went back to revise. Um, the nice thing is that, so to kind of just to wrap up and conclude, I think the nice thing is that all of these eight cities, uh, so this, this work is going to be uh, published in Nature Communications. I think the paper will be out in uh, three or four days time. But the really nice thing is that because the reviewer gave a lot of really good suggestions, uh, it is a difficult paper to review actually. So we went back and a lot of work. So we went back actually to ask the eight cities, uh, the representative from the eight cities. And that is almost, I think almost a year and a half has passed after the workshops. And the, the really interesting thing is that seven out of these eight cities, they actually reported additional work that they are currently doing. And they actually want to use um, these models and scale them up to the entire city. So this includes uh, securing maybe national funding to model the entire city, uh, securing research grants, securing private uh, partnerships, things like that. So we thought this is really cool because this, um, this kind of solidifies and um, our, our hypothesis that these models are really useful and actually uh, they, they are indeed impactful for, for downstream policy making and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, so our interest in UBEM spans beyond just test bidding these minimum viable UBEMs, but it spans across the entire process from data processing to calibration, uh, using different methods, standard EPS methods uh, to data science, machine learning, as well as statistical tools. Uh, so with that, I think I'll end my presentation. Uh, thank you for tuning in, of course, and thanks very much, Pamela. Uh, I know I ran a little bit over time. Thank you. Thank you, Yuqian. That was fascinating and an awful lot of content as well. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, there are a couple of questions in, uh, in the Q&A already. Um, so I'm just going to move on to that. If you've got any more questions, then please, um, please do raise them now. Just type them into the, the Q&A um, and we will go through those. Um, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, the first one I think is actually for me, uh, because someone's asking if it's possible to have the presentation, um, which is just to say that the presentation is being recorded um, and we'll put the recording on the IBIPSA University website and I'll uh, give you the details of that later. So the, um, the next one then is for Yu Chen, um, and this is um, a question about uh, the uh, city carbon in the last few slides that you showed, um, asking if it's based on operational energy consumption and grid carbon intensity. Uh, yep, so the attendees uh, assumption is correct. It's based on operational energy consumption and um, grid carbon intensity. So what we did was we took, uh, so for every city, we took their current grid carbon intensity and we also took a projected one. So some cities, they I think they project to have maybe I think zero carbon intensity. Uh, in the case of Singapore, they don't really have exact projections. So we took the historical values and we just projected them linearly. And so in the last chart, you will find that uh, there's really a range. I think if you see the green bars uh, for the shallow and the deep retrofit, there's a range because we are not uh, making an exact judgment at this point of time on how much uh, carbon can we actually save? So we provide a, a range of the worst case scenario, which is the grid intensity, uh, the grid remain constant. And the, the best case scenario is that if they manage to decarbonize and make the grid a lot cleaner. So that's the, the green bar that uh, you see. So the yellow color is uh, we also put up, uh, we also simulated uh, the rooftop PV potential because that will help make um, the building is a little bit greener in a sense. So we also simulated the rooftop uh, PV potential in the case of Singapore, you will see that uh, the bar is, is not that long because Singapore is high dense, density, public housing. So the rooftop, you don't really get that much area, but 
in other regions, there'll be a lot longer. So yeah, um, you're right in a sense. Thank you. Um, and the next question is about the peak loads. Um, so uh, what methodology do you use to diversify the loads, even for the heating and cooling, to avoid constant peak loads when you're modeling at scale? Got it. So I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question correctly, but what we did is for every city, uh, we actually have information and we got information on um, the different uh, the different end users when we simulate the energy, for example, lighting, heating, um, lighting, heating, uh, electric, plug appliances, things like that. And uh, we match them to whether this was using already, for example, clean electricity, or they were still using um, fossil fuel or things like that. And then we run the simulation for um, 876, 8760 hours a day. And then we find out what is the, uh, the energy use for each time step. And then we match those. And then we, after the shallow and the dip retrofits, and then we, we ran them again, and then we match them up and to see where the, the peak loads actually shift. And this is aggregated for the entire uh, region that we modeled from. Thank you. Um, can I just follow up on that? How do the uh, the building archetypes that you're using affect that um, in terms of occupancy profiles and so on? Do, um, is that basically a feature of how many different occupancy profiles you have within the model itself? Yes, uh, you're absolutely right, Pamela. So for that, we actually based on the assumption and information that the city representative gave us. So for some uh, because in, again, I'm Singaporean, so I like to use Singapore as an example. Uh, I think more than 80% live in public housing. So the archetypes can be somewhat similar. So you can see the archetypes for Singapore, we don't have that many archetypes, maybe one or two uh, in that seat region, but for other regions, there'll be more archetypes and the occupancy profiles and the schedules that we use are uh, hopefully reflective of those. But these models are not uh, calibrated in a sense because we don't have access to, to measured data. Thank you. Um, and then the next question is from Sam Ferris, um, asking whether the projected EUI reductions were calculated using Energy Plus. Yes, uh, we, so we have, an, we have a plugin that uh, was developed by our lab, it's called UMI. So that sits on um, Rhino as an add-on, but the engine, the core engine is Energy Plus. So that provides uh, like a GUI graphical user interface for it, but we are calling Energy Plus. Thank you. Um, and here is a question from someone thinking hard about the practicalities of it, um, about simulation time, um, as, which obviously depends on the scale of the project. But can you give um, any insight, like an average number, um, about simulation time? Mm, got it. So for for these seat models, they are really, really fast. I would say, um, I think I can confidently say less than an hour for every one of them. Uh, maybe 20 to 30 minutes or 15 to 30 minutes on average across. Uh, so that's because in, in UMI, we don't actually run simulation for every single building, every single level broken into four like core and parameter zones. So what UMI does is it runs a, a shoebox algorithm that does clustering and it, I'm not sure whether string is the right word, but it creates this shoeboxes with one core and parameter zone uh, different number of shoeboxes for representing different buildings, and then uh, the values are scaled up. So there's another paper on this, but uh, what this shoebox algorithm does is that it significantly reduces the simulation time, especially if you have a city with a lot of similar buildings. We can just have, let's say 10 or 20, I'm just throwing a number here, shoeboxes representing this. So what this shoebox algorithm does is that it simplifies, uh, it reduces the simulation time significantly but the accuracy of the results as compared to simulating every level and every building is, is almost uh, similar. So because so with this, uh, and this is inbuilt into the plugin that uh, our lab created, but this reduces the simulation time. So with this, for these deep models, they're actually quite uh, lightweight and fast. And that is the reason why in the workshop, we, we decided to go for these seed models first, because I think a lot of the policy makers, uh, the folks, they, they wouldn't want to be sitting there waiting for a simulation to be done in a, a, a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, and now um, a question from Argiris, one of my colleagues, um, 
about uh, different use cases um, for different contexts, for example, in the global south? Uh, I agree. So again, I would like to add a disclaimer that we are not, uh, so I'm not saying that these four cases are definitely representative of everything in the world. I'm sure that there are other ways to classify it or other use cases as well that we haven't thought of. So I, yeah, I'll agree with the comment by the attendee. Yeah. Um, and another question from someone I recognize um, is about the cost and value um, and whether that would change um, if UVM um, becomes open access, um, which allows others to take up and use the models instead of just uh, developing their own each time. How do you see that changing over time? Yeah, so I think this is so I think this is a really good point. Uh, what we are hoping in our group is that uh, the cost will go down significantly, but the value will still be there, right? And so one thing that we're hoping to do is to democratize a lot of these UBAM tools so that they are not uh, just being restricted in, in research labs or universities that have like PhD students or postdocs to work on this. Um, and I think like, as I've mentioned, there are a lot of, uh, there are a number of really cool work and groups, like Pamela's group as well, Pamela and Paul's group working on this uh, in Europe. So we work, a lot of our work are in the US, I would say of uh, Europe, Paul and Pamela's work is probably really, really, um, amazing and to kind of democratize some of these tools to make it a lot easier rather than having to go through like the entire process of uh, having PhD students cleaning LIDAR data like me when I first started putting together everything because then the policy makers wouldn't want to look at it right because it takes too much of their time and it's too technical so yeah I, I agree I think over time the cost will, will go down significantly. Okay. Thank you. Um, so how many developers um, were involved in building the tool and how long did it take overall to build it? Mm. So we didn't really, I, I may be wrong. So I didn't build Umi, uh, I built Ubem.io, uh, which is a web-based app. Uh, we didn't have any external developers. It was uh, PhD students, uh, Christoph, my supervisor, Christoph Reinhardt's PhD students, uh, and maybe one or two Europe's undergrad uh, researchers. So I would say, between uh, three to five, working on different parts of it, uh, maybe a year or less, uh, but it's an ongoing project and they're always improving it, right? So for UBMIO, which is the web app, uh, it's a Python-based web app. It took us about a couple of months to get an MVP up, um, up to a year to get a working version. And there was, I think, three of us working on it. And then when we tested uh, with the eight cities, I think there was maybe at the 10 or 12, 10 to 12 months, uh, Mark. So there was a little bit more than a MVP, but uh, there was kind of a rough, a very approximate time frame that it took us to, to build it. Thank you. So we've got two more questions now, um, and I'll stop at that so that I've got time to show people where to go uh, to find the recording afterwards. Um, the first one could be perhaps a long debate, um, so I'll ask you just for a brief response. Um, how much do you think the use of physics-based models will be influenced by machine learning models in the future? Do you see a possibility that physics-based UBEMs become obsolete? Mm. Yeah, so I think Pamela is right. This will probably be a long debate. Uh, I don't want to speak for everybody. I'll just speak from my own experience. Uh, so when I first started my PhD, that was what I thought as well, because coming to MIT where computer science is a really strong uh, topic, right? I thought, okay, machine learning, data science is really the, the next, like it's the next, next year thing. And then it's going to be based uh, physics-based simulation and all, but I was, I was wrong. Uh, so I took a lot of ML classes, physics-based classes as, as well. Um, and I think, I think what I want to say is that the core building physics and the knowledge of building science is inherently still really, really important. And it, in a lot of these instances, we can't just surrogate a, a physics-based model with a black box because it's not, it's, it's not like making a prediction like Netflix, okay, which a recommendation system where, okay, which is the next show you like, right? For building physics, we want to be understanding what goes on inside these models, we want to be able to diagnose them. We want to be able to, to understand the parameters and the equations. Um, so I think ML, um, neural nets, or data science methods, they will augment these physics-based models and help us overcome some of the shortcomings, like lack of data. For example, at urban scale, it's very, very tedious to get 
uh, all the window to wall ratios of all the buildings, right? So we can use CNN to, to grab those. So this method will augment uh, physics space models. So we will see more and more hybrid models, but I, I don't think it will ever be the case. And obviously I'm hoping that there wouldn't be a case where machine learning uh, methods will completely rebase physics based simulation. And we can't just take like a CS PhD, uh, no offense to the computer scientists here, but CS PhD with no knowledge of building size and then get them to run a black box model. Uh, it just doesn't quite work that way. But again, can validate this is my personal sentiments and thoughts. Yeah, the picture is very interesting. So one final question now, um, which is about uh, any open source reference models and data sets that are available. Uh, yep, there are a number, in fact, uh, just off the bat of my mind, uh, different cities and municipalities, they released uh, shape files and the US shape files, property tax assessment data, which gives you the, the properties of the building. Um, DOE has some building templates for residential buildings and commercial buildings. And these are what uh, these are the building templates that we adapted from. A lot of these are open source. Uh, Microsoft released uh, a data set of building footprints uh, for the US. And I think in the Europe there's tabular data where we can try to get some uh, building properties. And I think recently there's a paper in uh, scientific data that released uh, an open data set of uh, building footprints as well as program and age in, for the whole of Europe, I think. Yeah, so there are a few of these uh, open source reference models and data sets. I think it's just that nobody ever put them all together, but there is quite a number if we just take it a little bit. Yeah, so thank you so much, Yu Chen. That's been absolutely excellent, really informative. I've really enjoyed that and I hope everybody else has too. Um, just in the last few minutes, um, I'd like to uh, tell you about the future seminars in this series. So in May, we have Professor Rajan Rao, who's going to talk about um, a very specific case um, in the Global South, developing an urban building energy model for Ahmedabad, the challenges and the lessons learned there. Then in July, one of my colleagues, Shaya Mamrith, is going to be talking about uh, the use of urban scale simulation and stock level retrofit uh, decision making uh, based on his PhD work around optimization of urban scale models. Then after a break in the summer, we have Aisha Demir um, from the University of Wyoming, who's going to be talking about the impact of spatiotemporal resolution on the calibration of urban energy models. And then finally, um, in November, to wrap up this series for the year, although possibly not uh, all together, because we already have uh, a lot of ideas for, for other speakers and interesting uh, seminars on the on the same theme. We have Tian Zheng Hong from LBNL who will be talking about the opportunities and challenges going forward. So this seminar and all of the others um, will be on the IBIPSA University website, uh, sorry, YouTube site. So um, if you have a look back tomorrow, you'll see that. You can also see uh, the recordings of all the various uh, seminars that have taken place in the past. Um, there's been uh, quite a lot. We've got 41 videos up there. Um, if you wanted uh, an open source education in building performance simulation, this really is the, the place to go for that. But I'll close now, bang on the hour, and say thanks once again um, to you, Chen, for, for joining us and sharing your insights. <laughs>